been studying 1 Timothy 2 along with Augustus' marriage laws. Are the two related, i.e., women shall be saved through childbirth related to just trium laborum? Is Paul showing a strategy of advancing the gospel versus a home life strategy? <laughs> well, Oh, we'd warm up with an easy one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, the answer is very easy. I, I don't know. Um, uh, I, um, it may be that there are some recent commentaries on First Timothy which discuss that possibility. I haven't, I confess, come across that myself. Uh, of course, we always have to put in the scholarly twitch of a footnote that not everyone thinks Paul wrote First Timothy, but even if you do, that's actually not the bit that people normally discuss. The bit people normally discuss, well, they do discuss that, but the bit they normally discuss is um, the bit which is translated in the King James Version, I suffer not a woman to teach, etc. Um, but, and there, I think, there's something quite different going on, because the Greek is quite odd. There's a word there which occurs there and there only in the New Testament, and it's not clear what it means. Um, so it is, a, it is a contentious verse. The bit about childbearing, it's quite possible that it does actually have resonances with some bits of Roman law. Um, I'd need to see that spelt out, and I haven't, I'm, I'm not aware of, of how that would work. I think the normal reading of the woman will be saved through childbearing is that he's actually been alluding to Genesis 3, and in Genesis 3, the pain of childbearing appears to be part of the curse of the fall, and I don't think he means, however you read it, I don't think he means that the way for a woman to be saved is by having children, but that when a woman has children, um, the curse of the fall, okay, it'll mean pain, but you will be saved through it, as it were, rather than that this is a means of, of salvation. Can you put into a, a, a capsule uh, the Holy Spirit in Paul's theology? Can you? Well, um, not easily, but I, there's a couple of things that I would say, and I just hinted at them before, that if you live in a world, the Second Temple Jewish world, where there is this sense of puzzled expectation that God has promised He will come back and dwell in the midst of His people, then the place that He's going to come back to dwell is, of course, the temple. And the word that you use for dwelling in the temple, living in the temple, is, is the word which in Greek has the root oikos, which means house. He's coming to take up residence in this house, en oikeo, to live within. Paul uses that language and the image of the temple. You've got more questions coming, far more than we can possibly take, I'm sure. Paul uses that language and that imagery of the temple to talk about the Holy Spirit. In other words, he sees, and this is again and again, he sees the Holy Spirit as the way in which the God who promised to come back to His people has come back to dwell in their midst. 2 Corinthians 3, the famous passage about, about the Spirit, um, he's, he's there working with the end of the book of Exodus, and the end of the book of Exodus is about the building of the tabernacle and the Shekinah, the glory coming and dwelling within it. So when Paul uses that language about the Spirit, this is the return of Yahweh to Zion language, this is the new Exodus language, and then when he talks in Romans 8 and Galatians 4 about being led by the Spirit to the inheritance, this is again clearly Exodus language where it is the, um, uh, the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, which is God's own personal presence that leads the people to their inheritance. So when Paul says that about the Spirit, you can't get a higher pneumatology than that. People have often said that the early church didn't really figure out whether the Spirit was God or not, and it didn't happen for 400 years until the Cappadocian fathers had done their work and so on. No, the early church struggled for hundreds of years to catch up with the very Jewish idea of the full divinity of the Spirit, which was there in the very earliest text. What distinguishes the W-R-I-G-H-T right perspective on Paul from other ways of reading Paul in the New Testament. I, I, I will put it into my language. What makes your view and those who share it uh, distinct or stand out from the views you read from other people? The, it's impossible to answer because there's dozens and literally dozens and dozens of different views on Paul out there and 
to map even a few of them would be very difficult and inappropriate here. I think, though, that some of the critical things have emerged quite clearly tonight, namely a focus on the Jewish narrative, the single Jewish narrative from Genesis through Exodus right the way on through leading to the Messiah, but that single Jewish narrative not as a steady development. People have sometimes tried to express it in terms of progressive revelation of God, gradually revealing more and more and more of himself until finally Finally, there we are with Jesus. That's not how it is at all. But nevertheless, it is a narrative. It just goes through all sorts of twists and turns and seems to go underground and be lost completely. And then the new thing happens. But when the new thing happens, it is the fulfillment of what God always said. He would. There's a paradox there. One of my students was struggling with this in a seminar, and he said, I think what we're saying is that God acts shockingly, surprisingly, unexpectedly, as he always said he would. Um, and so there's that, there's, that sense of, there's that sense of a narrative with something radically new, and yet the radically new thing turns out to be the fulfillment after all, to everyone's surprise. So I have worked that through in terms of the continuous narrative, both of Israel in exile and then the restoration, and of Yahweh returning from exile. I don't think most of my colleagues have done it like that, and I know that some of them are really rather resistant to the idea, but, um, you know, there we are. What, mm. pract well. what practical suggestions would you have for churches to engage in theological discussion across denominational lines? Well, theological discussion is something we ought to be doing across denominational lines. The best way of doing it, to be honest, is to read the Bible together. And uh, one of the thrills that I had towards the end of my time in Durham was to spearhead some ecumenical Lenten Bible study groups, really because uh, I was the Anglican observer at the Synod of Bishops in Rome in 2008 when they were discussing the Bible, and all these Catholic bishops saying, what a pity we can't share the Eucharist with our Protestant brothers and sisters, but there's nothing stopping us reading the Bible with them. And I eventually, it was my turn to speak. I said in, um, I didn't put it quite like this, but nearly, wish you chaps had said this in 1525. Life would have been so much easier. Um, <laughs> but, but, but we've had a wonderful time in the north of England with ecumenical Bible study groups because if you start with the big dogmatic statements that, ooh, do you believe in this dogma or don't you believe in that one, then you go round and round in circles and half the people present, probably they learnt the dogma in Sunday school but they haven't thought it through. But if you take a psalm or a parable or a bit of Romans 5 or 8 or, or a bit of Revelation if you're daring, you know, and actually just sit around and pray and say, what's this actually about? and get a little bit of help here and there. Then, actually, the divisions which emerge in the group will often have very little to do with the denominational divisions. They may occur at quite other, at quite other places, and you will just learn a huge amount. Yeah. Um, your Paul book is number four. How many more volumes will you <laughs> write, and when? Uh, it's a question you should ask my wife, I think. Um, the, the, the aim originally was five volumes. There was an extra one that snuck in there. The one on the resurrection wasn't part of the original plan. So technically, it ought now to be six because the next one ought to be on the Gospels and then the final one ought to be basically on early Christian missiology. Um, I don't know um, is the answer. All my adult life, I have wanted to write the big book on Paul. I now have finally written it, and in some ways, I'm feeling a bit nunc dimittisi about it. You know, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I hope I will be able to do that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, this one gets read simply because of its title. To the very right, Reverend Wright. <laughs> one, as a minister in the Presbyterian Church of America, PCA, I have witnessed much debate over your, quote, new perspective, close quote. Could you summarize your perspective on justification where it differs from Calvin or from the Westminster Confession? Uh, I could. It would take about half an hour, which we don't have. But let me just, I mean, let me say a couple of, put down a couple of markers. First, I'm much closer to Calvin himself than I am to, say, either to Luther or, I think, to the Westminster Confession. But that's, that's a kind of a technicality which not everyone here will be, be, uh, be needing, perhaps. Um, the, the critical thing about what I and some others at one stage about 40 years ago called the new perspective was a fresh reading of Second Temple Judaism. If you read Josephus, Philo, the scrolls, 
Tillerlum, all the literature of that period, you don't find people saying, we want to go to heaven and the way to do it is to do more and more good work so God will be pleased with us. You really don't. Yes, you do find people saying um, that when we know who God's people are, um, they can know that in the present because they possess the Torah, etc. And at the final judgment day, God will see how well they did with keeping what they were given. And people say, well, there you are. That's Judaism for you. Trouble is, um, Jesus says exactly that in Matthew, and Paul says exactly that in Romans 2 and 2 Corinthians 5, etc. You know, at the judgment, each one will be judged according to what they've done. Um, the idea of a final judgment according to works does not mean that all Jews were proto-Pelagians trying to pull themselves up by their moral bootstraps. It simply doesn't. So the first and most important thing, I think, about the new perspective so-called was its reappraisal of Second Temple Judaism. Now, of course, Judaism's plural were very complex in the period. There is no monolithic thing which you can just say, there it is. Nevertheless, that immediately frees you up to say, so what was Paul's problem? Why did he say in Galatians what he does about beware of, of that, of that uh, Jewish way of life which is trying to pull you in as Gentile Christians? And the answer then is not that they're trying to teach you about how to justify yourself by doing good works, but they are trying to have a form of the people of God which remains for Jews and Jews only. So anyone who wants to join it has to become Jewish. And Paul says, no, the meaning of the cross is other than that. It's that the whole business of the people of God has been translated out from there. So that's the, that's the real emphasis for me of the new perspective. The trouble is that Ed Sanders, who, was the, who wrote the biggest book that launched the new perspective, never, I think, saw that narrative of Judaism, never saw a lot of that, which I and several others, Richard Hayes, for instance, have made central. And so within the new perspective, there are major problems. And Sanders particularly, um, his book was not actually about theology. It was about patterns of religion. That was the subtitle. And that's a real problem because many people in America have said, oh, well, new perspective, it's all about a horizontal thing rather than a vertical thing. It's patterns of religion and community rather than salvation. I never said that. Dunn never said that. Hayes never said that. Um, Sanders did tend to push that way because that's what he was studying. So there's, there are problems there. When it comes to justification itself, <sighs> I tried to do a brief summary towards the end of chapter 10 of the book, and the brief summary, I think, had about seven points, one of which subdivided into a further seven. Um, it's, you know, it, do, it does get complicated, but basically it's about God's eschatological judgment, decision, that means God looking to the future and saying, instead of saying we're waiting for the end before we say anything about anybody, God has brought his future judgment into the middle of history in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is where God has said, here are my people. I have dealt with their sin. I have launched new creation. That's happened in the crucifixion and resurrection of the Messiah. Therefore, those who are in the Messiah have that verdict already pronounced over them. What is the badge that says they're in the Messiah? Answer their pistis, their faith. And so Paul says three times that we are justified in the Messiah. That's something which many Reformation traditions have not said. Calvin actually did say that. I don't think the Westminster Confession does that nearly so well. And as a result, the Westminster Confession develops from the Reformers this idea of uh, God or Jesus having righteousness as something which they've got a lot of, which they can then impute to the sinner. That's a clever way of getting the result, namely that you're okay now because of what Jesus did, but actually it's not something that Paul ever says. And I will defend that to the hilt because there are one or two potential counterexamples like 2 Corinthians 5.21, which people here will know about perhaps. But um, it seems to me that the Westminster Confession was trying to get the right results, namely assurance, by the wrong means and distorted several key passages in order to do that. 
And so I'm, I'm not saying that the Westminster Confession's aim of stressing grace and hence stressing assurance, nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross I cling, there's nothing wrong with that, it's just that I think there are more biblical ways of doing it rather than less biblical ways of doing it. That, that's a very, very, very short answer. And since this is going on the internet, there are about a thousand hostages to fortune there. And if you want to pick them up, please take it up with my book first before you write to me. Thank you. Okay. In, 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 in that regard, our, our speaker that, that we have next coming, uh, Dr. Floyd, uh, I recall as a student in his class one time, uh, uh, someone asking him, and I'm going to tell you this story and then ask you your comments so I can ask him about it uh, in light of what you said when we do this with him in a month or so. Uh, a student said to him, Dr. Floyd, would you tell us about the day you were saved? And he says, oh, I would love to. It happened almost 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and he started describing that, that very thing. And those who are in Christ, that was their, their moment of salvation. Would you uh, have any comment on such an approach? <laughs> that, that's a great approach. I mean, the gospel, the word gospel is good news and, new, and it's news rather than advice. You may remember about 20 years ago, there was a movement in America called the Jesus Seminar um, 15, 20 years ago. And the Jesus Seminar were taking all the news bits out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they were bringing in lots of stuff from the Gospel of Thomas and, and other documents like that, and they were turning the whole thing into good advice. Here's how you might like to live your life. That's not what the original message was about. It was about something that was happening as a result of which everything would be different. And something was happening then, something would happen in the future, and the point about what happens to us is that we find ourselves caught and held between that decisive past event and that ultimate future event. Um, so, yes, great answer um, that, that, that actually it was when God did what God did in the death and resurrection of his son, the Messiah. That's the real event. And in a sense, what has happened to me is really very trivial by comparison. The danger with much later Protestant and revivalist Christianity is so much emphasis has been put on the me that that plays into either a romantic or an existentialist feature of late Western culture, which then makes Jesus just the means to an end, to me having an experience. And you know, my experiences are, in a sense, irrelevant. Um, what matters is what happened and what will happen as public truth. Okay, time for just one or two more. Um, uh, the, the problem I have, I'm trying to be faithful to your questions, but everything he says, I want to ask more questions about <laughs> myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm fighting that. Uh, uh, fighting that. Um, who is your favorite theologian from church history? That's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I, it's not easy to answer because I'm very eclectic in my reading. Um, and I've enjoyed different people at different stages. I'm talking while I'm thinking. I mean, I, I did learn a huge amount from Calvin when I studied him, um, but I found and have found since all sorts of things which make me think, but no, actually, um, you know, that's just not the way it is. Having said some rather um, daring things about Bart before, I still think Bart was one of the great Christian minds of all time. Um, and I think some of his later work, the, the further you go on in the church dogmatics, the more I think I want to agree with it. Um, and of course, one of the things that was going on there was that Bart was seeing very clearly, very early on, what was wrong with the Third Reich, when an awful lot of people in Germany and elsewhere in Europe couldn't see it at all. And, you know, one honors him for that while criticizing him on, on other fronts, as, um, you know, I hope that in future people will find things to honor me on as well. I know they'll find plenty to criticize me on, but... Uh, um, so, yeah, I want to say Irenaeus and Augustine as well, but I'm not a scholar of either of them. Um, I just think, yeah, those are extraordinary minds. And even, again, where we're going to disagree, we, we can learn a huge amount. Would you join me in thanking him, and would you give us three minutes?